So, Sophia, we just got out of Dance Data Council. This is fantastic to get to talk to you actually in Austin at your house. So, what I do we want to talk about today? Thank you so much for coming. There are so many startups that we met at Data Council, and I compiled this huge list. It is a crazy list. And we kept adding to it, too. As we were discussing, we realized that there were like five more startups that we hadn't gotten yes, on the list yet. So, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. So, I added all the startups in the list that I met this week or interacted this week. So we have a column of what does the startup do and I categorize them into different categories and put some random thoughts in the sheet. The reason why we have Dr. Housley here is because I am a newbie in data engineering world and a lot of the startups are data engineer focused. We would like to have a better understanding of the startup scene in the data world. So I, I think one of my big takeaways um, is that we seem that we seem to be entering a new genesis of data engineering companies, in the sense that we have a kind of couple of big flavors of companies that we saw over the last couple of years. I think the main theme, uh, maybe through 2022, is what I call modern data stack, and so modern data stack tended to be companies that were built around uh, these like highly scalable SQL-oriented data platforms like Snowflake and BigQuery and Redshift. And so they tended to operate within those platforms, do things like ELT, so in other words, you load your data in, and then you have a transform layer that runs on top of that warehouse. And the interesting thing in this conference is that I talked to a lot of startups that were building new data tools that maybe could run outside of that, uh, that range of tools. So for example, we talked to how many different streaming companies did we run into? Maybe five or so? A lot. A lot, yeah. <laughs> and so <laughs> that's of interest to me because my talk at Data Council was actually about fusing uh, real-time and batch processing. And so streaming infrastructure is a key underpinning for that capability. And so I was really excited to see a lot of new kind of new blood, new talent getting into this space and building new tools to support that use case, to support simpler streaming, more scalable streaming, more efficient streaming. And so I'll be, I'll be curious to see where a lot of these companies go and what kind of traction they'll get. What was something that stood out to you? Like what were some new tools that you noticed that you hadn't seen before? Oh, there are so many. Yeah. So... Um, speaking of streaming, I feel like s there are some database-based streaming tools and some of them are not a database. Yes. It's very interesting. It's like there are so many streaming tools but they have their different focus. Some yeah. of the tools you can't even write SQL to their thing. You need to write like JavaScript yeah. to query the data and feed it into other databases like Snowflake, BigQuery. But some other tools, they are in-house query engine, um, has all the database capability. So it's very interesting to me. Yeah, and a lot of the companies I, I talked to uh, try to somehow piggyback onto other technologies, which I think really makes sense as a startup, right? So if you're mm -hmm. a brand new tiny company, you can't afford to build an entire infrastructure from the ground up. So I talked to one company that was building a data processing engine that was not, strictly speaking, a database. So it just runs on top of, like Snowflake, for example. It connects to Snowflake, reads, but then does very sophisticated processing on top of that. The other thing I noticed is that there were a lot of companies that were doing things around Python. Specifically, I, I saw one Notebook. company was doing like Python compiling to kind of a database. So they'd take like Pandas and compile it to make it more efficient mm. and scalable which if Python has um, an Achilles heel, it's that it's not super fast, right? It's not like Rust or C or anything like this. And this company was like building a tool where you could take your pandas and then it would compile it and also distribute it out to a cluster, which was kind of cool. Right, yeah. so related to that, yeah. Python related, yeah. I am a notebook girl, I'm a yes. data scientist. So I noticed there are several notebook related startups. Uh, I mean, and D is already well known, but there are other notebook services coming out. Yeah. One of them really stood out to me is that that notebook service looks like Notion. Mm. It just changed my mind because ah. in, in a traditional sense, notebook, you have different sales, but then I never thought about, okay, what if we don't need the sales? What if we just have the Notion mm. um, as a blank page or Google Doc and you do backslash sale you get a sale if you want to do it mm -hmm. and then you could work with sql you could work with python you could with work with r uh, you could do visualizations you can have your report built right in that document without i don't know translating your notebook sales into a google doc or copy mm. and paste screenshot your results i think that was really cool to me 
That is cool because it, it seems like we sort of diverged from the original point of a notebook, which was for it to be a processing engine that also provided built-in documentation, like you immediately had a document. And it seems like Jupyter, it's kind of, it doesn't look very pretty when you do that anymore. Yeah, exactly. I feel okay. like the Jupyter UI could be a little mm -hmm. better now. It's yeah. been so many years and the UI didn't change at all. Yeah. What, what do you think about so what do you think about local notebooks that run on a laptop versus notebooks that run in a cloud or a remote environment? That's a great question. So I think it's a trend, right? Mm -hmm. To get more cloud running notebooks. People just don't want to have to set up the environment locally. If they just want to click a button or just to click a link to get your notebook and be to be able to share your notebook with others. Yes. In fact, my company Anaconda Notebooks is a cloud notebook that you can have free access to a certain limit. Feel free to try it out. <laughs> Definitely check it out. I mean, I, this is something I harp on quite a bit, actually, coming from kind of the data engineering perspective. This is one of the Achilles heels for data science for a long time has been that data scientists would set up this local environment. They'd download a small amount of data, do some cool stuff with it. And then they would try to share it with someone else and like someone else would try to install the same dependencies and it would break because Python is kind of tricky that way. Yes. And so like pushing the notebooks to the cloud means that you don't have that problem anymore, that you can actually collaborate, which is used to be hard for data science. Exactly. Like for Anaconda notebooks, at least we have some of the built-in uh, environment for you, um, but then you can also create your own environment Yeah, in the cloud, really easy. Another trend I see is the LLMs for data. Mm. I was surprised that I didn't see more startups uh, at Data Console. Maybe this is not the right uh, venue for them because I know there must be a lot of LLM startups going on this year. Yeah. But a lot of the LLM startups specifically looking at data. How do we understand data? How do we ask a question and get the uh, result immediately from a language model? That's pretty fascinating to me. Well, it sounds very compelling. I'm sort of wondering how companies are attacking the problems that we have with LLMs, right? <laughs> the propensity of LLMs to kind of make things up or hallucinate, as they say. Right. Like, if you can solve that problem, then then you're in business. Like, if you can take the LLM and, and make sure that you constrain its output so it doesn't do anything crazy, then that sounds pretty compelling. So. Yeah, and there, there are several uh, players uh, at this conference. I think it's a very competitive market. Everyone yeah. is trying to build such applications and who can build better ones. I don't know. It's probably we'll see. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's a time of a lot of innovation. I, my opinion is that just taking the same approach that we're taking right now and just like throwing more and more parameters into LLMs is probably not going to solve the problem. But I think there will be innovations that change the way we use LLMs that maybe will make them much, much more powerful. And uh, we'll have Skynet within a couple of years. So don't worry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll be watching for those startups that we saw. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'd be curious to try on their product. Oh, I have another one. Okay, yes. so I, we mostly weren't going to talk about startups by name, but I feel like this startup was just kind of in the air. Like everyone was talking about this particular startup, so I have to bring it up, which is Duck uh, DuckDB Mother Duck. Oh. What are your thoughts about Mother Duck? <laughs> um, yeah, they're friendly. I'm friends with the their uh, founders and people. Um, it's very confusing to me, the relationship mm -hmm. between Mother Duck and mm -hmm. DuckDB. And what I learned from the conference is that they're not related, actually. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. So in other words, like DuckDB doesn't, uh, Mother Duck doesn't own the DuckDB code base, the open source, for example. Yeah, they're not okay. the creator of DuckDB. Yeah. It, it, it was not clear to me because before I thought, oh, maybe they're the same group of people. Mm. Because normally your enterprise solutions on top of an open source solution yeah. is your original team forming an enterprise solution. Mm -hmm. So this case is a little different. So what do you think of DuckDB? I think so. I think DuckDB, for what it's intended for, just so let's just talk about the open source for a second, is a very powerful tool. The problem is that like a lot of open source, there's a lot of management required, for example, to collaborate with data. If everyone is running their own copy of DuckDB to make sure that they have the same data and they stay in sync and they're running the same queries. And so at least the way I understand it, and someone from Mother Duck, correct me if I'm wrong, the goal of Mother Duck is to sort of have a back end that would back up DuckDB so you could have collaboration and you could have a consistent environment across different systems. And so to me, that, that's a very promising idea. Obviously, it's like a big challenge to build all of this and get it right and like serve the enterprise and everything else. 
but yeah, I mean, it, the team is is really exciting. I, they've done some amazing things at other companies like Google, and so if they can continue that track record, then they should have a really cool product in you know in the near future. But what do you think? Who are their competitors? Ah, well, that's the tricky part, right? So I think <laughs> any any kind of like cloud data platform is going to be a competitor, and so they're stick they're stepping into a very crowded marketplace. They're trying to do something new. It's like any startup, the danger is that your competitors copy you, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's what I'm interested to see is like if they can really launch out there, find the enterprise customers quickly and build up a customer base as they're building out a really compelling product, so. Makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so the other thing I see at the conference is there are so many, so many data catalog companies. Yes. What do you think about the data catalog companies? That's an interesting one. So. I definitely, I think the concept of a data catalog is very, very important. Um, doubles in the details, obviously. And so I'm kind of watching these different competitors to see who's going to get, you know, a lot of mind share. It's like any tool. Mm -hmm. Getting a lot of mind share is really critical. And so, yeah, the space is very, very competitive the way I see it. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if like one of them will pull ahead or if there are going to be a bunch of competitors fighting out in the space over the next several years. What about data observable? observability because to me it's like coming hand in hand right it's both yeah data quality data lineage yeah access control like it's all kind of come together they should be like merged somehow yeah i kind of agree so there's been i, I don't know if you followed this discussion on twitter about uh bundling versus unbundling was that 2022 or was that 2021? The time is just like since COVID, it's all blurred together. But right. like basically, we've been having this discussion for a while. And I mean, I, I kind of agree that we need, need more bundling. Like I don't, if I am a manager who has a budget for data and I'm looking at tools, I don't want to have to buy five different tools. I just want to buy one, right? Or maybe, maybe I want to buy five instead of 25. Right now, it feels like you have to buy 25 different tools to have a data catalog, data lineage, data observability, data quality plus the actual data warehouse, plus ingestion, plus reverse CTL. Like it, at the moment, it seems like a lot and it's really overwhelming. Do you think just maybe Snowflake, instead of integrate with all the tools, maybe they can just do them all? They, they You mean like on their own platform? Yeah, just natively. Yeah, I. Um, that's a good question. So some of their tools are really, really great. Like I, I think Snow, SnowSite, like the interface is really good. Other tools they've crafted are not as good. And so maybe maybe they have certain things they do really well and other things they want to outsource to third parties. Like orchestration, Snowflake tasks are okay. They're just very basic and they get the job done. But like I wouldn't want to build out a big orchestration DAG using tasks. It just doesn't make any sense. So that kind of raises questions mm -hmm. like, oh, do they really want to invest the resources to be in observability and to be in a data catalog and to be in lineage? Um, the other thing I'll say about catalogs specifically is that one of the main selling points of a catalog is that it spans different tools, right? So I can have a catalog that tracks Snowflake, that tracks maybe S3, that tracks, tracks Databricks all together in one place so that I'm not having to move to each tool to see what's going on. And I would assume if I were Snowflake, I really wouldn't want to do that, right? I wouldn't want to be cataloging my competitors' data sitting on S3 <laughs> separately outside of Snowflake. So. That's a very good point, very yeah. good point. Um, yeah. Another trend that I saw was cost. There are some yeah. companies just trying to optimize cost and try to, there was one company try to simulate what kind of uh, cost or infrastructure you mm -hmm. need for your project mm -hmm. and tell you maybe you should use this kind of instance instead of the other one, mm -hmm. or how do you optimize this instance? Uh, so what do you think of those kind of companies? I think it sounds interesting. I usually like to see some other combined value proposition, if mm -hmm. that makes any sense. So the company I was talking about that was building like a kind of a compiler for Python to make it more efficient and distributed, um, wh what I told them is like, that, that sounds interesting for co from a cost perspective, but it also sounds more interesting from a workflow perspective. And I said, you know, pitch it as cost, but also pitch it as workflow. So for example, if you as a data scientist are building uh, some kind of notebook or, or some kind of like uh, pandas data frame or something, you can put it in production without completely rewriting it. Like me as a data engineer, I now have, don't have to totally rewrite write your work to deploy. And so that for any of these companies focusing on cost, again, I'd, I'd want more than one pitch, if that makes sense. I want like to, in terms of moving the needle, I don't know, just talking about reducing costs doesn't always seem to be enough. So. That's a good point. And also 
they focus on they tend to focus on like one type of mm -hmm. infrastructure yeah. because you need to do a lot of hard work to yeah. make things work to simulate different things uh it really doesn't like generalize to other platforms right in fact, I'll, I'll go back to something I said in my talk, and that is I had a slide about complexity and basically mm. how in data engineering and data science, true, really, we have this complexity problem, right? So, for example, I talked a bit about the Lambda architecture, which is not brand new now, but like people use the Lambda architecture, and it's super, super complicated and hard to manage. And so, in general, I'm looking for more tools that just make, that reduce my overhead, that reduce my complexity. And so, tools that like automatically reduce costs, manage assets, do monitoring kind of all in one place so that my ops team has a reduced burden for things they have to think about. Because it feels like mental bandwidth, like stuff we have to think about is one of the biggest costs in technology. Like it's just the, the human cost is very, very high sometimes. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Complexity is a big thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, and there is other tools like BI tools that came up quite often yeah. in the startup scene also. I just feel like yet another BI tool is kind of boring. <laughs> like what's your selling point? Like, right? And I saw those websites, I just don't feel like very conven convincing to me mm. why we should use them instead of other things. <laughs> yeah, I, so, so it's funny. Um, Joe Reese and I in our book on fundamentals of data engineering, in the last chapter we talk about like predictions for the future. And one of the predictions is that someone will come up with some kind of new concept for a BI tool that's really different. I think the big problem with BI tools is you get into them and they feel kind of similar. Yes. Um, and so, oddly enough, like we're we're looking at an Excel spreadsheet. But it's actually not Excel. It's uh, Google uh, Google, Google Sheets. Sheets. Yeah, we're looking at a spreadsheet right now, though. But if you could come up with like a BI tool that would somehow combine spreadsheets with other things in a way that people thought was really interesting, that could be like think about the market size for that would be enormous. But I feel like you've got to find some way to differentiate yourself so you're not just another BI tool to do that. Exactly. Even yeah. though. Someone gave a talk just to talking about how they're different, how they're thinking right. um, things differently, like with different concepts. Yeah. And then when you look at the presentation, it's basically the same. Right. So right. Uh, that's very weird or interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then there, there are at least two feature store companies that I saw yeah. at the conference today. Yeah. What do you think of them? I think it's an interesting concept. Um, Feature stores are kind of taking a very specific slice of ML workflows and attacking that slice. And it does feel like something that can move the needle, but like you really have to convince people to even try your product out to get in the door to like try this out. And then they have to rebuild their workflows around this feature store to make sure they're storing their features, not just like building them in isolation. I don't know, what do you think? Because you're, um, you're, you're very much in the vein of data science right now. So what, what do you think about feature stores? Um. It's just like, I don't know. I don't have thoughts actually. Mm -hmm. I feel like we need to ask Mickey to come. Yeah, yeah, to we, need, Figgy, yeah <laughs> we, we need to do that. That will be another YouTube video. Okay. Yes, okay, well I'll leave that one for Mickey. Okay. She will explain that better. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think, do we cover all the categories? Probably not, there are so oh, many categories. Yeah. Like we are, how many different startups, is it 53 or was there a heading row? Anywhere, there are like 52 or 53 startups and I don't think we even encountered them all at the conference, but. It was really a great opportunity to connect with a lot of data people. It was very cool. Right. We yeah. have also privacy. We have other things. We, um, there, there's a company that is building tools to make data sharing easier across organizations. It's kind of related to BI. Like there's kind of a BI option, but it also provides APIs kind of in one place. So that was interesting just because every company I've worked with has had trouble sharing data or getting data from partners. And so just making that process easier could be a really big business. Right. Yeah. Well, I have to say one thing I really appreciate yeah. is a lot of the um, startups actually started from open source projects. Yes. I'm a big fan of open source, so I'm really glad. And they keep maintaining their open source project, which is really nice. Yeah. So. If you want to try them out, just try the open source version first. You might not need their enterprise versions for your needs. Yeah. Who knows? Well, typically what happens with a lot of these open source projects is if I'm doing a simple project on my own laptop, I just run it with open source. And then as I start getting into more of an enterprise use case, I kind of have a choice to make. Either I have to have an ops team that works with that product, which can be very, you know, it takes a lot of man hours, woman hours, or I can just 
pay them to do it. And that's often like, once you get to that point, it's like, Oh, I'll just pay them a few thousand dollars so they can take care of this for me. Right. Yeah. And that way, I mean, the thing with open source is someone has to pay for it. Like it's not actually free. Like it takes a lot of time and effort. So thank your open source contributors. Thank these companies that are building open source projects. And like part of that is using it. And part of that is making sure that people are getting paid to do this work. So yeah, the way I see it. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Anything else we should say? I think that's it for now. Um, we, we probably could have lots of follow-up conversations on specific areas. So we'll have to do that another time. Yeah, we'll probably write follow-up blog posts yes. on different areas of categories. I know I, I'm very interested in notebook-related or LLM, LLM for data-related yeah. uh, startups. If you know any startup that fits in the categories we're talking about today, please send it our way and we'll love to add them to our sheet and investigate. Yeah, that sounds great. And also um, our data council talks, my understanding is will go out on YouTube at some point. I don't, I'm not sure how soon that will happen. But again, my talk was on fusing real time and batch data and your talk was on explainable AI. Yeah. And so yeah, look forward to those coming out. And maybe we'll write some articles or do some YouTube videos on those talks to go a little bit deeper as well. Okay. Thank you so much. See you next time.